Bob Herbert's op-ed.tv is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation with the support of Ann Ulnick. After a pair of tumultuous presidential elections, public opinion pollsters have been left battered and bruised. They were mostly wrong, right? Well, no, that's not right. There were a lot of problems. And as the old saying goes, mistakes were made. So what did the polls get right? And what did they get wrong? We'll talk about this with an old friend and one of the best pollsters in the country. Dr. Lee Miringoff, director of the Marist College Institute for Public Opinion. Lee, thanks so much for doing this. I appreciate it. Oh, it's great to get a chance to see each other, even if virtually. <laughs> How about that? So the polls last time around um, basically got kind of a bad uh, rap. They, they were not uh, wildly off, and, and, and most of them were in, in the vicinity or were actually uh, correct. And as we recall, Hillary, Hillary Clinton um, won more than 3 million popular votes um, than Donald Trump did. Uh, this time seems different. It does seem that a lot of polls undercounted uh, Republican strength and, of course, the, the, the specifically the strength of uh, Donald Trump. So I'd like you to do a couple of things. Talk a little bit about what happened four years ago and then uh, explain to us what's different this time around. Well, I mean, thinking, first of all, let me draw uh, some ge general overall points uh, from, you know, 20,000 feet, as we say. First of all, <laughs> science is messy, but it's the best thing we got. So in a sense, <laughs> we, 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 you know, we, if you want to have information that's independent and the media and the public can absorb it if they want or not, um, you know, this is sort of the best thing we got going. So that right. doesn't mean it's perfect. Uh, people know the phrase margin of error. What well, that really means is that all polls are estimates and they fall within a certain range. Um, the numbers look very precise. Uh, sometimes you even see decimal points applied to some of these numbers. <laughs> and, and, and that's the furthest thing from what they are. So you, you have to sort of accept that these things are, you know, within range, they're the best guess. And then there's a lot of things that go into it, not the least of which is it's a moving target. The campaigns don't stop to allow us to poll uh, and then continue after the polls completed. Right. So, so, so that's a lot of it, uh, just in terms of both years. I think what also happened in 2016 and somewhat this year also, you know, we have this group called forecasters. Polls are snapshots. They try to just measure where we are. Um, there's a group, uh, and it's 538, and HuffPo did it in, uh, in 2016, and uh, YouGov, and there's different groups, economists, and what they do is they take the polls and they put them through a model, and then they come up with a notion that Hillary Clinton has a 90% chance of winning, or uh, Joe Biden has an 85% chance of winning, and that really defines a narrative of inevitability, um, and, you know, how do you communicate uncertainty? How do you communicate probabilities? Well, that's part of what we don't know uh, and aren't doing very well. And it creates this impression of, of, of a uh, gap. And if you say that someone has a 60% chance of winning, you're not saying that person's going to get 60% of the vote. Right. That's, a, that's a huge difference. But I think the public does so, not understand um, uh, those percentages when they talk about chances of winning. Yeah. And, and I actually think, and I thought this four years ago, I actually think that pursuing that does more harm than good, because I think that confuses um, more than half of the, more than half of the population. I totally agree. And I'm not sure what those forecasts would change. I mean, you know, if we get a forecast and we want those an 80% chance of rain, uh, and it doesn't rain, and I went outside with my umbrella and my raincoat, you know, I don't really care. It's not a big deal. But if I say <laughs> there's an 80% chance that Hillary Clinton's going to win or a 90% chance right. that Joe Biden's going to win, and that doesn't happen, then we've actually touted people in the wrong direction. 
The polls can provide a narrative. We can talk about, you know, whether people are, you know, planning on taking a vaccine if it uh, if it becomes available. It uh, we can talk about issues and, and and whether the economy matters more to people than uh, the coronavirus and then who they're going to vote for, uh, you know, based on your views on those things. We can find out whether people like these candidates or not, and find out that in 2016 it was the lesser of two evils. But this time, people like Joe Biden. Right. And therefore, it wasn't a choice. It was really all about Donald Trump. And the polls can provide that roadmap. Uh, short of, well, someone is so going to carry Pennsylvania by three points, and they carry it by six. And, and that's somehow misleading, even if it is within the margin of effort. But it did seem, from, um, from what I've been reading up on this um, since the election, it did seem that, and, and, and I'm going to get to um, yeah. what the Marist poll did in a moment, but right now I'm talking about polls in general. Uh, it did seem that a lot of polls undercounted Republican uh, strength in, in some key areas. Yes. And so we've now seen a lot of that. So do you have a, a sense of what's going on? Yeah, well, I think, first of all, this year was a very, very tough environment. Uh, in part because of the coronavirus. Obviously, it's a healthcare issue more than it is a polling issue. And right. I don't want to I don't want to conflate those two. But from a polling standpoint, we had an enormous number of people voting early by mail. And then we had a group of people who were voting early in person. And then we had a group of people who voted on election day. Right. And those three groups were very different in terms of their preferences for Biden or Trump. And in, in this instance, we did not know, in a sense, the proportions in the recipe, what, how much of which ingredient was going to be. So we knew there was going to be different groups of voters, but you had to make your best guess as to how big each of those were. And if you understated the day of a vote, then you were understating the Donald Trump vote. And again, these aren't by 10% differences. These are sort of nuanced differences, but editorially, it makes a, a huge difference if someone is winning by one or losing by three. Uh, right. Some of the differences were very small. I, I yeah. absolutely agree with you. That, that and then we uh, had a, a second problem with this. In, in the people who, and this was a subtle problem, and I don't mean to get too far into the weeds here, but if people told us, well, first of all, you normally ask people a hypothetical question. If the election were held today and the candidates are such and such, who would you support? If people then had already voted, their answer was, I've already voted. Uh, and then the next question is a little bit different, but has a you know a subtle but important difference, I should say. And that is, who did you vote for? Right. And that kind of crosses the line a little bit from a hypothetical, who would you support if the election were held today, to who did you vote for? And I think we had people um, who were refusing to answer that in a higher percentage than we typically had. And um, I think that those people uh, who were more likely to be Trump supporters, not because they think it's a fake poll or fake news and they don't want to tell us the truth, any of those things that people banty about, but it's just a simple question wording that threw off the recipe a little bit and threw off, uh, you know, understated the Trump support uh, overstayed the Biden support because that was, in a sense, already in the can. That was people who had already voted. Uh, right. It was a different different chemistry to that. So there was all kinds of problems just from a, uh, a, a technical standpoint uh, that, that the context of the selection was uh, very, very different. Um, so how did you guys do the Marist College poll? Yeah, well, what we were, we, we pulled four battleground states in, um, in conjunction with NBC News, uh, and we pulled in Arizona, which we were, you know, let me, let me only talk about Arizona, because that one we said was going to be 48-48, and it, it went into extra innings and only recently has been projected, so that right. was our best one. Pennsylvania, we had uh, Biden winning. Uh, he didn't win by as quite as much as we had him, although the votes are still being counted there. And I think one of the things in this rushed judgment on the polls is you got to wait for the votes to be counted. Um, a lot of people on election night thought Trump had won. Yeah, and we knew that there was going to be a red mirage in the industrial states because Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan don't count the mail early. And that was by state law. They couldn't. And so as a result, right. we, we knew, we didn't know whether there was enough mail to 
make it Biden in the end, but we did know that it was gonna change as the, as the days went on. Those two states were fine. The two states that we were not happy with were North Carolina and Florida, uh, both of which we had single digit advantages for, uh, for Biden. Um, uh, the Cuban Americans in Florida and uh, you know, clearly did not come out the way that, that, that we expected. Um, or they, I should say they came out in much greater proportions in rural parts of North Carolina and other states around the country, which right. is why all the organizations, the campaign polls, everybody was really not on target um, because you had this huge rural vote for Donald Trump. I think Joe Biden got the votes he wanted to uh, and they hoped to get. I think that there was just, you know, Donald Trump can light a fuse under his supporters um, and they are very loyal and they saw all these pictures of Democrats lining up early to vote. And I think in the end, there were 4 million people in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania who fit the demographic, demographic profile of a Trump supporter who didn't vote in 2016. And right. if Donald Trump was anything, he was all about the base. And he'd been spending four years pumping that up. And when he went around the country that last weekend, uh, five, five stops a day, I think he made sure that his folks came out on election day. And it really swamped the estimates and it, and it almost got him reelected. Would you um, anticipate uh, changes over the next four years because the polling is not just for presidential elections, sure, I mean, it's sure. for a lot of other elections as well. Would you anticipate uh, changes or adjustments in the methodologies yeah, over I, the next four years? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and to get back to 2016, you know, we did not um, concur with what the pollster community felt was the error was people didn't wait by education. If they just had waited by education, they would have got it because they wouldn't have missed these people who don't have a college education. Yeah, saying. I read that a lot. You disagree with that. Yeah, we totally thought it was all about geography, that it was not about demography in that sense. We felt that right. even in rural areas, you have metropolitan um, groups, you know, bigger towns in rural areas, you have to get the right mixture within even these rural communities. So we felt it was a sampling issue. Um, and we did a study on Kentucky in the governor's election, uh, in the off-year election. Uh, and we really looked at all the different ways of measuring and weighting and all those kinds of things. And as a result, we felt we were more on target. And clearly the magic bullet of 2016, this waiting by education, didn't help the, all the other pollsters. Right, right. <laughs> it did not. So, so I agree. I, I think we're seeing comments now about, you know, there's a, a density difference. There's a density divide that we're getting more sensitive to the fact that where you live really reinforces, you know, your political attitudes. And we see this, you know, huge difference between the big city vote, the suburban vote, which for all intents and purposes elected Joe Biden, and right. then this rural vote, which came in in bigger numbers than expected. So the answer is we're gonna to have to keep fine tuning that method of selecting who we talk to because that's really you know, a big deal. It's not that they were shy Trump voters and it's not that waiting by education fixed it. Um, it's a question of you know, who are you getting into your sample and do you end up with the right chemistry? And, and as I said, this was a very tough environment because of the huge early vote. We don't even know yet what the exact proportion was to people who voted by mail or not. And right. that's a question, you know, we only mail people, measure people's intentions. We don't actually measure whether their vote was counted. And if there was some fraud as is being bantied about, my guess is it had to do with some mail that wasn't being delivered. Not that some election inspectors were ripping up Trump ballots. And I think there was some undercount of the Biden support because the mail just didn't get there on time. I actually want to want to get to that because I think that there were a number of things that could easily have skewed uh, whatever anybody might have thought about that, whether they were the professionals or, or even just the um, uh, people who are uh, interested citizens. But before we get to that, one of the things uh, or the thing that most of the polls got right is that Joe Biden would emerge the winner in, yeah. in, this, in this election. And uh, so he's gonna be president, but what a task um, he faces. I mean, the country is 
so divided, as you, you mentioned to me in a, in a telephone conversation uh, that we had the other uh, day. Now, it, it um, strikes me that um, because of his temperament, uh, his experience, his inclinations, uh, Joe Biden might just be the right guy for the right time. Or maybe this is wishful thinking on my part, but this is the thought that I have. Uh, talk a little bit about what you think about the particular qualities Joe Biden will bring to the presidency. Well, I think first of all, um, and I felt this kind of all along, is that this is a man who's had real life experiences. Right. Uh, coming off of Donald Trump, the one thing this country desperately needs, if I can put on my editorial sign, you know, we should say commentary <laughs> now, under a little bit. Um, but the country needs someone who has greater empathy for the suffering of others. Uh, we are in the midst of a, a global pandemic where you know, around a quarter of a million people have already died in, in America. Um, and we're, you know, kind of on our way to more because we're just starting to spike again. If, if even if we got past the first wave, we're right. really, what we did, we're certainly getting into a much, it's not a blue state issue. It's a, it's a, a national issue. That's right, exactly. And, and, and shame on Donald Trump for politicizing the wearing of a mask. Um, and, and that I think in the end, uh, the history books will really talk in terms of that having just been a horrible, horrible thing, despite the fact that doing all these, you know, super spreader events and, and the number of people even in the White House have gotten sick, including yep. the president, um, it, you know, it's it, it just absolutely baffling baffling uh, to me that that, that, has, that that has gone that far. So Joe Biden comes to this with empathy. He's obviously had experienced a lot of death in, in his family uh, in terms of two children who have passed away one back when his wife died in the car accident. Yeah. Um, and that was a daughter. And then of course, Bo, his uh, son uh, more recently. Uh, and, you know, I think as a man, those experiences affect you. I think also he's a consensus builder. Um, although it takes two to tango, and we don't know what uh, McConnell's uh, majority leader is going to do, whether he really yeah, we don't know if the Republicans will cooperate. We, don't, we just but, don't but know I what agree the, with you. Biden will try. Yeah, yeah, I think he's you know, and that maybe he's outdated in that sense. Maybe his consensus building is not where uh, we are today as a country, and maybe you just have right. to take your base and rev it up into a frenzy like Donald Trump did, and then sort of just try to, you know, make it everything fourth and one, and you try to get the, that one yard. Um, but it would be nicer, I think, for the country, ultimately, if we can kind of get past these, you know, the, this divide, which, I mean, we're, we're a narrow but deeply divided country. We're almost two equal parts. Uh, but the, the, the wall separating people is just as deep as, uh, Oh, certainly, uh, you know, maybe back as far as the Civil War. I mean, I can't think of, I mean, the 60s are starting to look a little tame. Isn't uh, that something? Which I, I thought I, I, I agree said. with that 100%. You and I lived through the 60s, the late 60s with those Vietnam protests. Mm -hmm. We had riots in the cities uh, in the 60s. There was uh, uh, turmoil in, uh, a lot yeah. of the time. And this, to me, seems worse than the 60s. Yeah, we've had four times the number of deaths uh, in America from the virus than we had in all of Vietnam during all the years that that went on. And this has all been in, in roughly eight months. Um, and the, the first responders, uh, I, I can't think of any group of people, uh, the nurses, the doctors who are literally putting their, you know, their, their lives on the line. Literally. And, and, and for trust was, to, 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 push that canard um, that they make money off of the deaths yeah. from COVID was just one of the worst things I've ever heard. And, and, and I read also, I agree with you totally, and I read also that there was a doctor or a nurse, uh, I think it was a nurse on TV I saw, um, talking about this guy has COVID and he's arguing with the nurse in the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> that, that whether this is real or not, and that he thinks he just has the floor. Oh, right. And she takes him in a wheelchair and brings him down the floor, which has 25 patients, and 24 of them are on ventilators, and he's the only one who can talk. And he comes back realizing, you know, that the light has hit and that this really is serious. But there's right. a guy with COVID denying it. 
and which I, tells you just how dangerous yeah. um, these false notions that are yeah. being spread uh, by Trump and, and so many others. It's, so, it's so, so my, dangerous. Yeah, my concern is, and, and I don't know whether you have insight into this beyond me, I'm desperate. <laughs> Um, you know, just the idea of how we get back from alternative facts and truth is not truth. And, you know, I, I feel like we're in a time where the world is flat and a lot of people think that something equivalent to that. Now we've, we've got to persuade them that the world is, is round. And I imagine that's going to take a long time. Yeah. So yeah. I'd like to talk a little bit uh, about the polling process. I mean, um, I've been up to your operation at, at, at Marist, and I got to tell you, um, and this is not an overstatement, it, it seemed kind of inspirational to me. <laughs> and the reason was the role of the students yes. in the operation of the, the Marist poll. Yeah. Can you talk about that? Explain what the students do and how you conduct well, the poll. It, it, it's, it's great. And, uh, you know, we are an educational program. We're known for our polls, but we're really an educational program as, as you experience when you're on campus. But what you would see now if you came, the room where we were doing the poll is empty because of social oh, distancing. So of course, of what's course. Fascinating I remember is, that room. What's fascinating is it's all being done remotely now. Wow. And that people are in these breakout rooms and they're in teams. And we, oddly enough, and this is probably the only thing that the COVID has done positive, is we no longer have the physical limitations of a workspace. So right. we we actually have double the number of students interviewing than we've ever had at one time. <laughs> so it's, it's not <laughs> That's um, interesting. And, 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 and as a staff, we've always worked remotely uh, because we work at very odd times. But um, so we have students who are taking coursework in survey research. We have students from all majors, over 300 students who are doing the interviewing now, uh, which is just, as I say, double the number we've ever had. Um, and we have, uh, we do a weekly podcast and we have what we call uh, um, uh, our C2C program, which is college to careers. And students are now in a group working as interns because they can't go to Europe now. They can't go to Washington. So right. we, we now have taken students inside the Marist poll virtually to do internships. Um, and they are doing either data side of it or the media side, social media. Uh, under the tutelage of, of our staff who conveniently have careers long in data analysis and in the media. So they're really getting a front row experience. And I'll tell you, Bob, we're both, uh, you know, kind of like the sunset of our lives is over the horizon. And it is so wonderful to see um, the dedication and the, the engagement of this current generation. Um, very practical. Uh, but very motivated, and um, and I, you know, I, I jokingly kid with them. You know, uh, you know, we're, we're turning over a perfect world, so just don't ruin it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. but, but I mean, think from the environment to healthcare to the economy to, you know, what what a horrible, horrible, you know, baton we're passing off. Right. But, but you know, this was a generation that grew up during the Obama years, um, and for them, Trump was really abnormal and atypical and they're thank goodness looking to get back to a, a more civil tone and maybe with joe biden some of that will occur and we'll and we'll we'll, we'll, we'll get to that but as i say you've got a court system that, that has to play ball you have the congress right now the house is very closely divided um this is a repudiation of donald trump but not of republicans and the right. House did very well. The Senate, uh, you know, we still have the Georgia races, uh, which will be very interesting. Uh, uh, from the, from the, the Trump perspective, if you're in Georgia, you can't say that the two seats will now give Joe Biden the uh, the Democrats the majority in the Senate, and that um, that uh, Kamala Harris would break the tie because then you're conceding the point with that that Trump is lost. Wouldn't that be something? Uh, I fear it's a long shot, but it will be great if it could come to pass. We've only got about a minute um, left. You know, I had uh, mentioned that you are one of the premier pollsters in, in the country, and, and I meant it. Meant it. The, um, the Marist poll has a, 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 a sterling uh, reputation, and you also, uh, you're a former president, and let me get the, the name straight of the National Council of Public Polls. Is, yeah. is that correct? 
Yeah, uh, so, so in, in, in my last minute, well, you can tell us what that is, but in, in the last minute, just tell us how one becomes a, 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 a public opinion person, a surveyor uh, by profession. How did that happen? It, 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 well, I think myself and my colleagues all got into this from different directions. Uh, it's not like you grow up uh, in high school and you say, you know, you want to be George Gallup. Uh, you know, you right. want to be, you know, you want to be a center fielder for the Yankees. That's what you really want to be. <laughs> right. And, and so everything else is second best. But, you know, I mean, I think, you know, I, was, I got into this because I was studying voting behavior and then it evolved. We've run out of time. I wish we could. I wish we could talk at least a, a little bit more, uh, but um, I'm going to have to sign off here. Um, uh, Lee, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, it was a pleasure and also um, and uh, enlightening. Dr. Lee Marengoff, thank you, of the Marriage College Institute for Public Opinion. Thank you.